This is Plate Mark. My name is Anne Schaefer, and I am your host. I'm an independent curator specializing in prints and printmaking. Plate Mark Series 3 is a series of interviews with amazing and wonderful people who hold various positions in the print ecosystem, and that ranges from artists to printers to gallerists to professors. Today's guest is Jason Shula, who is a professor of art at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. He asked me to help him spread the word about the Mid-America Print Council Conference, which is occurring next October 2-6, to 2024, at Kansas State University. So he is obviously deeply involved in its organization, and he wanted to spread the word about a call for papers or panels or participation of any kind from all of you artists out there across the country. So that's what we get to first. And then we move on to some really fun and fabulous stuff he's doing, electrolytic etching. Wait until you hear about that, it's incredible. And also his own work. So we've got lots to talk about. All right, let's see, positionality. I identify as a cis het white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Images Jason and I talk about will be over on the show notes, as you know, at platemarkpodcast.com. And also, you could hit the support and donate button and help me keep the lights on. I'd really appreciate it. All right, buckle up and let's get rolling. Jason, it is wonderful to see you. Thank you for coming on Plate Mark. It's great to be on, Anne. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. I'm going to let you introduce yourself for people because you just told me your name is pronounced a way that I did not imagine. So you do. <laughs> so my name is Jason Shula. I am a professor at Kansas State University and area head of printmaking. I've been teaching out here for about 16 years now. It's located in Manhattan, Kansas. I live here with my wife, Melissa, and my son, Calvin, who will be starting third grade this year. And my daughter, Karina, who will be starting kindergarten. Oh, boy. You're in the, in the thick of it. <laughs> it's the first year they're both going to be in school, so oh. it's going to be a, a little bit of a, a, a break, hopefully. A little shift. I remember thinking when they were that little that it would never end, and then they hit five in kindergarten, and it, like, flew. <laughs> it feels like it's it's flying, and it's, I told my students that, you know, I'm also on sabbatical this year, I should mention, because it's a really exciting thing for me, but... My wife has been waiting for five years to get some time to herself, and I just watched her smile slowly leave her face when I said, good news, I'm on sabbatical. I'll be home, too, for a I'll little bit. I'll be home, so. and I'll be expecting lunch <laughs> at 1230 every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the real reason, well, that's not true. Several reasons why I wanted to talk to you. One is about your work. Two is about the research you've been doing with a very cool method of etching, but Primarily, before we get too much farther, I wanted to talk about the conference you want to launch, not launch, but you want to put out this call for proposals for, for artists. So you go. Yeah, and it's, it's really the top thing on my mind, too. We are hosting the Mid-America Print Conference at Kansas State University. It'll be in the fall of October 2024. It'll be October 2nd through 6th, so it's a little over a year away, and we're really excited about it. Been working with the board over the past six months, and we're working, you know, it's almost daily meetings working through. It's an exciting thing, but uh, to let everyone know a little bit about it, in case you've never been to a print conference or a Mid-America conference, um, it's a printmaking-based conference. The conference title is From the Ashes, Printmaking, Preservation, and Renewal. The website is mapc2024.com that has the conference theme and a little bit of a trailer video. But briefly, it's about printmaking and printmakers and their relationship with the natural environment. Feeds into my work a little bit, like you mentioned, and about we develop safer and environmental sustainable processes and materials for printmaking. So it feeds into a lot of the research we do here, but also printmakers all over the country, all over the world are interfacing with the environment and commenting on the environment um, in many different ways. So we're trying to keep it very expansive in that regards. And Manhattan, Kansas is also home to the Kanza Prairie, which is the largest natural remaining prairie in the United States. So um, we thought for all those reasons, it made a really great place and time for us to, to host the conference. And you might be familiar with the, they burn the prairie every year for rebirth. So from the ashes, I think represents that a little bit also represents, you know, the inks and the materials that we use and, you know, we're also coming out of COVID a little bit, and we also see a little bit of renewal there where we can finally start to get 
printmakers back together. I think a lot of us miss getting together as printmakers and demonstrating and working together. So we hope that by fall 2024, that'll be farther in the rearview mirror and we'll be all together talking and making prints. Uh, I got to say to everybody, I was in uh, Kansas and Manhattan and Lawrence and several other places during a print council conference. And Jason hosted the group and showed us all of the research he's been doing and lots of work by artists and students that were there. And the prairie, I had never seen the prairie, never thought about the prairie for two seconds. I'm an East Coast person. I was stunned by its beauty. I couldn't get over how gorgeous those hills are. It was so beautiful. I mean, it's worth the trip. It's really amazing. I guess when some people think of Kansas, maybe they think of flat. Maybe they don't think of anything at all. But I thought of maybe uh, this flat landscape. But we're in, in what's called the Flint Hills, and it really is beautiful. And having spent a lot of time in Italy, it does remind me taking a train through the Tuscan hillsides and seeing those. So it really has a similar feel to it that you, that connects you in that way. And you see the land a lot differently. And also seeing the land go through the different stages and the different uh uh, seasons. It's just, it's really amazing. I grew up in Florida. So for me, it was about the beach and that kind of environment. And I never realized that the landscape can have that feel to it too, and that you can get that connection to it. So it's a really interesting place to visit and see and experience. Yeah, no, I, I highly recommend the trip because it I just, I couldn't get over how beautiful it was. And your facility at K-State is really fantastic. So... So what's the call to artists that you're trying to broadcast? So the first part of the conference, now that we have the theme, is to put a call out to artists. So we've recently released the call out for proposals. And if you're familiar with print conferences, there are things like panels. And panels can range from large auditorium type of thing with two or three speakers down to smaller roundtable discussions. We really are willing to accept anything in traditional or non-traditional panels, but any way people would like to talk about their work, you can propose a panel where you already have speakers. If you have people in mind and you work in a similar way to people, you can propose in that way, or you could propose to host a panel and then put a call out in the next couple months to actually put a panel together. So um, panels is one thing that is part of the conference. Exhibitions is another. So we are one university in Manhattan, Kansas. So for us, exhibitions are going to take place in more of a pop-up style throughout uh, the campus and throughout the town. So it can be anything from a formal exhibition to proposing to have work shown in one of the coffee shops or restaurants downtown during the open studios. And again, you can propose to show your own work or you could propose to put together you and a few other artists. Um, So exhibitions is another thing. One really cool thing at printmaking conferences is called theme portfolios. And to propose one of those, you actually propose a theme. We hope that they they are in some way related to the conference. We'll look at all of them. But if they are conference related, I think that makes for a more unified sort of conference. But in saying that, the themes are are purposely very expansive and and made in a way that you can interpret it uh, pretty broadly. But for a theme portfolio, you propose a theme and then you either pre-select people that you'd like to propose it with, or you can put out a call over the, again after it's been accepted and put together. In the same way people apply for an exhibition, people can apply to be part of your portfolio. Artists in that portfolio make a print related to the theme of the portfolio. They addition it out, so every artist in the portfolio gets one set of the addition. Another set goes to MAPC, which goes into their permanent collection. Another set will go into the collection here. As a student, it's a great way to get into a collection. You know, your first collection on your resume, it's a really exciting thing. And it's cool to be part of MAPC, which is something, if you're in the field between MAPC and SGC, you'll be involved in for, you know, the rest of your life. So um, let's see, that's portfolios, panels, exhibitions. I hope I'm not forgetting any. (laughs) <laughs> they think that's the main. Oh, oh, sorry, demonstrations, of oh, course. Oh, that was it. One of the coolest things there, yeah, is demonstrations. <laughs> so you can propose to demonstrate at the conference. And proposals can be traditional, like a demonstration of a traditional process in a traditional facility or a really alternative thing. We hope that we get a range and we're encouraging a range of proposals that don't necessarily fit the mold of a traditional demonstration because our facilities are limited compared to a conference that might take place in a major city between several universities and art centers. So things like printmaking processes that could take place without a press or combined photography. Since we have facilities for all these different things, it would be awesome to have people um, proposing and demonstrating in these different things. I demonstrated 
the process that I'm really uh, using my work. I demonstrated it about 15 years ago at an SGC conference and from that have built a community of people that I have got to know that are now using that process and continue to develop it. And it was the way I got started and gained momentum in that process. So it shows how you can build, you know, from, from something like that too. Is there an opportunity for an open portfolio? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So we, uh, for every conference, there's an open portfolio. So when you um, come to the conference, you can participate in that and, I don't have the details in front of me, but you make a, a certain uh, amount of prints and bring a portfolio and you turn it in when you register. And at the end, you get a kind of a mix of prints from other printmakers who have entered it. It's also exhibited at the conference in full. So again, it's a way to exhibit your work if you haven't for the first time. But most of my students do them every year. A lot of times it's their first portfolio to do. And it's a nice one to do because you know, you're able to make something a little bit out of your comfort zone and you get prints from other students and professors from all over the country. And it's a great kind of start to your collection of prints, too. That actually wasn't what I was thinking of. I had I did not know that bit about the open portfolio. I was thinking more of like the like the, you know, when you walk into the hall and there's tables and you can sit there with your work and talk to people. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> that that. I think that that's one of the most exciting things for me as a student, and it's still one of the most exciting things for me as a professor and maybe more uh, uh, developed artist to go to and see the prints being made by others and to show my prints and get responses. I think it tends to be the most popular thing for, for, uh, for students and people to go to. And we will be having that. And what's really cool, and we just confirmed this last week, but we're going to be able to host it in a really special place. On campus, we have Hale Library, which is an amazing library that's just been fully restored. But part of it is a, uh, a great room. It's the students refer to it as the Harry Potter room on campus <laughs> because it looks like a massive, uh, as massive archway. It's very traditional Gothic sort of style room on the top floor of Hale Library. And they've approved us just this week to, to use it for the open portfolio. So it's going to be one of the coolest places to lay your work out and communicate with artists. I think it's going to be a really special, special place to show prints when you register for a conference that's a box you sort of check if you're going to be part of that. And it usually is broken up over a day between like hour sessions. So you get the chance to stand in front of your work with a group of artists. Then you get the chance to walk around in those other sessions and see work. And I think it is the most eye-opening thing to do um, as a printmaker to see so much work and you learn so much. You learn technical, you see content, you just, and you just connect with people. Students, Professors trade prints all the time. I think it, it really embodies what the communal spirit of printmaking is, I think, in that open portfolio. And it's something that uh, uh, will definitely take place here. And it's re really exciting. That's cool. The The Hale Library, we did not get to see on our tour of the facility. But I have to say, I was so surprised by the campus. I feel like it was, did I dream it was modeled on Duke University or something? Like it's, It looks like, I mean, it's a beautiful campus, all natural Kansas limestone. It's a really beautiful, walkable campus. That was something I loved when I first got here. I just love the feeling of it. I mean, it's a really interesting campus and everything is designed within a four minute walk of every building that was purposely designed. So it was walkable and the art department is right on the main quad next to the library. Yeah. It's a beautiful campus. I think non Kansanians would be surprised by, mm -hmm. by it. Another, another reason why you should go. <laughs> we should talk about deadlines before we move on to you and your work. Yeah, so currently the deadline is uh, towards the end of September. I think it's September 20th for proposals. I plan to do a series of Zoom, open Zoom meetings, if I can figure it out for interested people. I'm happy to meet in a group and kind of talk and, and help people understand if they have questions about proposing something or if they have questions about the facilities and what we have available. You know, in addition to what I've talked about, we have some really interesting and unique opportunities too. We're partnering with architecture and they have amazing fabrication labs. Our Hale library has another fabrication lab with, you know, nine or 10 uh, laser engravers. So there's things that we have that I, I'm happy to share with people that might help inspire them to, to propose something to do in some of the facilities. Uh, we also are a campus that still has a printing services that has offset presses and stuff. So um, of course, I'm really good friends with them over there, and uh, I train on offset presses, which is really cool, but we'll be doing something with that with the conference, too, and there's potential for an artist to collaborate in that and use some really cool stuff like thermal en engraving or thermal plate processing for lithography or printing on stone. I mean, there's really cool stuff they do over there that could be an, an interesting collaboration. It's or, a very uh, thin line between fine yeah. art and the printing industry. 
<laughs> the greatest thing about printmaking, you know, for me is how expansive it really is. I mean, everything from the first, like it says in the conference theme, blowing pigment across your hand onto a, a cave wall or a fingerprint, uh, all the way to printing nanolithography on, on circuit boards and things. It's all aspects of print involved. And one thing that's, I think, amazing about the community that I get to call myself part of is everybody embraces it all. You know, if you've never been to a conference, one of the most amazing things is you show up and it's not a faction of this versus that, but everybody embraces it. And it's a it's a great community, a great spirit that has done so much for me. Really, I will, you know, we'll probably talk a little bit about my history, but I was an undecided major. I'd never made art before college and what? found etching very late in my undergrad, went to grad school, had never been to a conference. I was very disconnected from a print world and a print, the print world embraced me and helped me go from not no, being a nobody, not that I'm a somebody now, but I was a <laughs> nobody to really accepting me as a nobody. And I think my story is the same as probably every printmaker you you know you interview on on the podcast. And what that community has done for me is something that uh, I'm hoping by doing this conference is a way to sort of give back and and do something special for uh, for the community. And it's not I should say it's not just me. There's a team of people here. There's a team, a big board at MAPC, so there's so many moving parts involved. And the fact that everyone uh, is supportive and willing to give their time, every department wants to be part of to see that is really exciting, too. And it's really helpful because it is a huge endeavor that I might have been a little crazy to take on, you know. <laughs> but I think it's, it's a, I, I do hope it's something that, you know, gives back and helps launch others the way that it helped me in my career, both as a professor and, and as an artist. I have no doubt that it will affect many an artist, a young artist and established artist. Because, I mean, printmaking at its very core is based on collaboration, right? So, you know, it's it's very in line with how we all think about the whole thing our, in our scrappy little corner of the art world. I tend to be an introverted person, and I think printmaking is a great medium for people like me because... You can be in your a private space and working on, you know, a detailed etching with a needle, and then you can walk into a studio and, and have this kind of social interaction, but it's on your terms. It's a nice mix of both of those. And for me, I think that's why I really kind of, you know, uh, gravitated towards it. Do you feel like you can look at an artist's prints and know if they're introverted or extroverted? Because I, when I look at your work, I, I can totally, as soon as you said, it, I'm like, oh, yes, of course. So funny. Yeah. As you asked me, I'm just thinking back to my students, you know, and I get students that are extroverted, and introverted. And I definitely think that you can see, you know, it, it, you know, it probably depends. There's so many processes in printmaking. I think different personalities are attracted to different processes for sure. I for think, sure. you know, um, of course, there's always, you know, uh, differences to the, you know, outliers. But I think for the most part, people do get attracted <laughs> to specific mediums and, and that can be for certain, you know, so in that way, maybe, I guess that's from a technical point of view, from a conceptual or a content point of view, I think some artists or printmakers have something direct that they want to say and use a medium and a way of saying that very directly. And those might be more extroverted people, you know, they have something they have to get out and say. And I think I, I can only speak for myself, but I, in my work, the process is, it's not that I don't have things to say, but I am always after trying to get to something beyond what I think uh, is important to say. I don't, I, um, I start with an idea, but I, that's more of an inspiration than what the content ends up becoming. And that idea is really just to get me into the studio to start making something, but I'm never beholden to that. And I'm, in fact, usually trying to get rid of that. And so, you know, maybe in that, in that way, how you put content into your work, that could be related to your personality. I don't know. That's a great question. And that is a, I've never thought it. about it till you were talking. Oh, I have to do a little digging there. So maybe we should do a little bit of, about your background. You, you, you have admitted that you weren't an art student until rather late, later than most people. Like I was drawing when I was, well, I'm sure you were coloring in the lines when you were five. Yep. Like I was. I was always drawing. I was the kid in high school that drew on everybody's backpacks, that drew caricatures of everyone. So I did that, but I never in a million years thought of being an artist or even thought there was something even you know, even that that was even a thing to be, I really never even considered it. Um, 
So yeah, I wasn't an art student, but I always drew. My daughter is a drawer. She draws every day with markers and I'm the same way. In fact, uh, this is really, my mom tells a story that when I was really young, I made her come into my preschool class and tell the teacher that the reason I was drawing with orange is because there's not a color for an actual flesh tone. Like I'm using that because it was a thing. And my daughter said the same thing. So I guess it's, it's more common than I thought. My daughter said the same thing to me, you know, when she was in kindergarten, I said, you know, dad, I'm drawing with this. And now they sell, it's really cool. They sell uh, markers. I just bought some for my daughter for her fifth birthday um, that are called Colors of the World. And it's a whole thing. It's maybe 20 different skin tones from a light to a dark. So I was always drawing and I always was, whenever we were somewhere, my mom would get out markers and pencils. If we were at a friend's house, I would always draw in that way, but I wasn't, the idea of being an artist or what that was uh, or taking it serious in any way wasn't something I had, had done until there's college. no artists in your family? Um, no, there's no artists in my family. My grandfather on my mom's side is probably the biggest influence on me. And he was somebody who, you know, would take rocks and paint eyes and nose on them. Or he, he was in that kind of a way. Um, there was no dream of being an artist for his generation or my dad, you know, so there wasn't, you know, it wasn't, there was not the possibility. I don't think of that, but he was a, probably would have been an artist had, you know, had there, and he's still alive. He's in his nineties now. And, oh, wow. Wow. And, uh, yeah. He oh, you are, you're it. a youngster. My God, my dad's 93. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> wow. Okay. So um, you went to Temple, right? Can I start by saying I went to undergrad at University of Central Florida and I just want to say that program is <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal drawing program. I went, I went from undecided major to taking a drawing class that changed my life. And really, I was a drawing major in undergrad. I took primarily drawing. I found etching in the very end of that. But professors that I worked with that I would encourage people to look up that aren't a lot are not on the radar. But Robert Rivers was my drawing professor. is a phenomenal artist. I think one of the greatest artists working. Um, Today, Rob Reedy is a ceramic artist who was amazing. Carla Poindexter is a painting professor. Uh, Kevin Heron was drawing. Key Francis, who is a phenomenal book artist and sculptor and sort of everything in Mississippi. If you don't know Key Francis's work, I'd highly recommend you check him out. Um, and Charlie Wellman was my photography teacher. All of them were, were amazing and really pushed me. And I was a soccer player. I was an athlete uh, growing up, and that's all I, all I wanted to be. I, I thought I'd be a professional soccer player from my daughter's age, kindergarten. When I got to college, I was an undecided major. I don't think students can really do that anymore with the way tuition is and stuff, but I was undecided major, and I took my first drawing class, and that to me felt like the closest thing to training for sports. It was that same kind of seriousness, and it was the same kind of get in there, work hard, and something will pay off. And and I think I, I accepted the idea of practice more than maybe others do. I think if you're maybe trained as an artist young, you come in and think, I want to be making my artwork. And I just saw it as practice, like working from the mind. You know, I never looked at it in that, like, I need to get to the good stuff because I didn't know I didn't, I didn't know I had any good stuff. I was just trying, you know, I was just going through learning. So those professors really taught in that way. And it was maybe not for everyone, but it was really good for me in that way. I didn't want to just mentioned UCF because really, and they still have an amazing program. I think it's a, it's a great school, University of Central Florida. I'm glad you, no, I'm glad you did. Absolutely. I'm always interested to see who that one teacher was that got you hooked. Yeah, and, 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 you, you know, know? When I was in undergrad and learned printmaking, it was really pre-internet, pre-social media. So I saw my professor's work. I saw a couple former students work and I had the, the privilege of taking history of printmaking. And I listened to your podcast uh, with the author who wrote the book on the oh, big- Linda Holtz. Linda Hall. So I, I listened to the podcast with Linda and, and it was, it was amazing to hear. It was amazing that that's a real person that wrote that book and to hear from her. I thought your podcast was excellent with her. And I, by the coolest thing I had the privilege to do is taking a history of printmaking class at the same time I took my first etching class. And, you know, we had that same book and I, I, ha I still have that book on my bookshelf up at school and I pull it out every semester for intro when I'm giving students ideas for prints. My influences weren't other people my age making work or weren't people different professors around the country I didn't know anything else existed except I knew the shop and some students that had graduated in the last 20 years and I knew uh history of prints so I'd go to the library and look at Goya Rembrandt and all of them so it was a mix of kind of that that kind of formed my my beginnings I feel like art departments should um well a they should have history of prints classes <laughs> a and b B, they should make that a point because I, I swear to God, I feel like there's 10 schools in the entire country that offer a class like that. 
History of Prince is is just such a cool history of art, and it's really cool to see when someone like Goya was painting for aristocracy that what he was doing when he got to sit down with a plate, you know, and the great thing about etching and printmaking, but etching specifically, you know, you have a, a needle and a copper plate. And, you know, when you're taking a history of painting class and you're looking at, you know, Michelangelo's Last Judgment and thinking, you know, it's, it's hard to even think I can compete with that or I'm working along that line because this is someone who was trained in these media. It was a whole different world. But you can look at a print in a history of print class of a Rembrandt and you can walk next door and get an old piece of copper and a nail and you are on the same level as him in terms of materials. There's nothing else in the way. And that I think is really uh, empowering as when you're young. For me every day, that thought of going to the studio like that and there's not, it doesn't matter who has better equipment, who has better gear, who comes from this, who has, it's, it's all just, there's a plate and there's a, there's a needle and there's a ground that's been made the same way since Goya, you can learn everything in a few days that Goya knew. And then it's just about what do you have in your heart to put out there? And I think that's something that I see inspire my students. And that's something that definitely inspired me. I don't know how often you assign this to your students, but you must assign them a after Goya. Because <laughs> there were 50 of them hanging when we were there visiting. We do the first first etching all of our students do here is the Kansas Capriccio. And uh, I started doing that right when I got out here. You know, when I came out here from Philadelphia to teach, people could not believe I was going out to Kansas. I could, I'd never been to the Midwest and I didn't know what to expect. And I'll tell you, the students out here are so amazing. I mean, the students I have worked with are just so hardworking, so eager to learn, you know, it just, it, so it's been amazing. And I, you know, when I was talking to friends back at home when I first got here and telling them how amazing the students were, and I just didn't think people really understood. So I said, let's do Goya's first plate they ever touch is going to be a a reproduction of a Goya. So they take a Goya Capriccio, they each select one, then they have to alter it in some way. Um, We take it through because I'm teaching them etching. We take it through a certain amount of line, certain amount of aqua tint, dry point. So it's never going to end up coming out exactly like the Goya. And the point isn't for it to be an exact reproduction of the Goya. And they also can alter the imagery. And uh, yeah, that's the first plate they ever make. And we've been doing that for 15 years now. We have a collection in our studio. Maybe I'll show it at the conference to see all these caprichos and the quality. People were amazed that these were the first etchings. And I just think how cool it would be as a student to just say, first thing you ever made and these i mean if you maybe we can post some on your website but it shows oh, we will, we will. the quality of them i mean they're, they're phenomenal and you know they also because we don't have history of prints this is my i have to work it into the classes in this way and they might not get a full history of printmaking but i think it's pretty cool that each one of those students learns one goya better than probably 99.9 percent of people in the world, you know, they know this goy, they know everything about it. And I think that's an amazing, I think it's amazing. It may be, it, it's maybe a little corny, but to me, it's, it's amazing to have that experience. Printmaking is a lot about accountability and honesty because you can't hide. It is a needle and a plate and it is, you know, a stone and a, and a, and a crayon. It is a chisel and a, and a piece of wood. So there, there's no hiding every mark you make, you know, there's an accountability to that. You know, I was a master printer at Flying Horse Editions way before it was the Flying Horse it is now. It was a little podunk thing in the print shop when I was there, but I still get get to claim it. But (laughs) printing for other artists, you learn this. As a young student, when you go into print for an artist, all of a sudden you get really, you know, you take it very serious. And then you start questioning, why am I not taking my own printing of my own work this serious? I'm taking this person. I don't even know this person. And I think um, maybe that's where I thought with the Goya, for them to sit down and have to grapple with that they're they're working from this master print they need to feel that sense of of uh, accountability and then when they move on to their own work i challenge them to put that same accountability in their own work because no one else is going to care about your own work as much as you do and you know and you surely shouldn't care about goya's etching more than your own if you feel confident that you have something something to say I, the thing that impresses me so much about that is that it's the first thing you get them to do which would in my brain be gentler to them if they were assigned it at the end. But I think that's a bold way to start them off. I'm, I Kudos to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we talk about your work, which is also intriguing, and I want to know more and see them in live and in person, tell us about this NEA research grant that you got and what you're doing. 
We got a National Endowment for the Arts research grant. It was the first one at Kansas State University, and it was called Transforming Printmaking Through Chemical Innovation. So I am part of a College of Arts and Sciences, which I really love because I think printmaking is an ultimate marriage of, of art and science. So I think we fit, you know, really well there. I've had the privilege to work with professors throughout the university. I have a lead collaborator named Dr. Stefan Bosman. At the time we got the grant, he was a distinguished professor in chemistry here at K-State. Now he runs the uh, University of Kansas, Kansas Research Center in uh, Kansas City. He was my co-PI on the NEA grant. I had demonstrated the electrolytic etching probably about seven or eight years before that grant. It was all building towards that. And then when I met him, I had been working through this. It was just really awesome to work together. We, we, be, we became very good friends. Uh, his wife, who is a really great printmaker, Katrina Bosman, who lives in Kansas City, has a studio. Um, she took my printmaking class first as a non-major, and we became friends. And then I met Stefan through her, of course, and we became friends for, you know, probably a year or two before we decided to write that grant. Working with a scientist like that is just phenomenal. We, we share an interest because his big research is in cancer detection and prevention. So, you know, Artists work with a lot of chemicals and materials, and we don't really realize how toxic they can be. And, and it's not that everything we work with is toxic. Sometimes there's small changes we could make if we had knowledge, a certain emulsion over another emulsion. Very little things that really, when a scientist looks at things, have huge implications further down. So I worked with Stefan on that grant to further develop the process, and um, it was really awesome. We also had a lot of partners, and it was not just us. We had a lot of chemists, postdocs, a lot of my undergrads and grad students worked on it. Um, Shelly Thorstenson, who you know was part of it. Evan Summers. Uh, if you don't know Shelly or Evan, they are both phenomenal printmakers, and you should definitely look them up. Uh, John Quick to see Smith, who's a friend of mine, was part of it. Um, and then uh, Ashley Taylor at University of Central Florida. Artists from all over come, and that continues. Hey, everybody, it's Anne breaking in for two seconds. Jason contacted me after we recorded to report in that he had forgotten to mention some very important people. So I'm, I'm going to pop in a couple of times and, and let you know who they are. An additional artist who came in and worked with the uh, project, the NEA project, along with Shelley and Evan and Jean Quick to see Smith and also Ashley Taylor, is Karen Kuntz, who teaches at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. We have a dedicated NEA research lab in Willard Hall, the art department, and we bring artists in every year to train them on the process. There are many artists in residence. We make prints with them. And so people that come to the conference will get to see that and all the artists we've worked with and how that's kind of developing. Uh, did I answer your question? As no. <laughs> Well, I have one question before we get to actually what electrolytic etching is, because uh -huh. we haven't even talked about what yep. it is, how it works. But did Steph, did you describe to Stefan the processes and what you were using at every step? And did his face go, oh, my God, don't use that? You know, uh, no, I mean, he was my buddy. So he was up here all the time. But there were very clear things because apparently, and I'm not a scientist, but apparently animal fat and, and nitric is a way to make a really dirty bomb. And so there's things like that that we use in printmaking. You know, we're alchemists in printmaking, right? We do share, if you know scientists, and I'm friends with, you know, like Stefan and other chemists, we share a lot of similar language and stuff. But everything that we learn is handed down from professor, artist to artist. And everything they do is by the book in a different way. So the best part for me personally about working with a trained chemist is not us sitting around and making work together or thinking up collaborations, but it's when I have a simple question of, hey, could I add citric acid to this or with, and to be able, someone just be able to give you an immediate answer to know that you're, you know, when you're safe and when you're not. And to circle back to the comments for a second, one of the coolest things about the conference, I think, is going to be a relationship between artists and scientists that we are, uh, are nurturing and bringing together. Uh, the Cancer Center, Stefan runs is an official sponsor. They're going to have a panel with scientists. So we will have actual scientists there talking about materials and printmaking. Uh, Stefan will, of course, be there. I hope that dialogue can start at the conference and people can then bring that back to their universities and start that because I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration and, and discussion, really, that can push push our medium you know, forward. Sure. Yeah. I, I, it took me a while to close my mouth when you were talking about dirty bombs. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's good to have scientists in your corner. 
the other thing about working with scientists is, you know, after the NEA grant, we published an article in Leonardo, which is an MIT Press uh, peer-reviewed journal on arts and sciences, and we published on our findings. And it's really interesting because we could tell that the lines we were getting were better than a traditional ferric etch. Um, I could tell by looking at them from experience, but they actually put them under these atomic microscopes, and we have images that look like craters on the moon. And they were able to show a lot of stuff that we knew, but we couldn't prove and they were able to prove it but but working with scientists and when you're dealing with 20 different baths with different uh dilutions and you know stefan would come in and i would say oh i topped that bath off and he would be topped it off you can't <laughs> top things off like they don't think that way so so you learn a lot but working with scientists can be interesting too because everything needs to be exact when you're trying to i don't think printmakers think think maybe lithographers think think a little bit more that way but yeah you know. probably Okay, so let's 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 get to it. What tell us what the process is that you've developed? And yes, I agree, the lines are finer. We'll get to that. We didn't develop the process. Electrolytic etching as a process has been around for a long, long time, and it's really based off of really high school level chemistry. It's based off of technology from the plating industry. So if you have a, a necklace that you want to plate in one material. You will have that necklace submerged in a bath of electrolytes, and you will have the material you're going to plate it with in that bath. And when you run an electric current through it, you will take the metal from the thing you're using to plate, and you will transfer it onto the necklace you wanted to plate, okay? All, all we're doing is reversing that process. So we're not plating our copper plate. We're plating a grid that we're putting inside into the bath, Okay. So you take okay. an etching plate, you put a resist on it, you draw through it, your lines of copper are exposed. Now you've submerged it into a bath, and on the other side, you have another piece of copper. When you run that in a bath and you run some voltage through it, the metal from your plate is being deposited on that other piece of copper. The only metal that it can find to do that with is those exposed lines. So we're not etching it away in a caustic way. We're just removing it and depositing it onto another surface. Does that make sense, Anne? Yes. Um, now it sounds simple and it simple, is simple, right? but it's simple in the sense that you can do it. You can do in a high school chemistry class. I've watched YouTube videos where you take a penny and you coat it or a nickel and you coat it in copper. So it's doable. People have been doing it, not only, you know, industry, but printmakers have been experimenting with it, you know, over the last, you know, 20 years or so. The problem that we found with it is it worked in theory, but the results were never, comparable, equal, or better to traditional process. And with printmakers, um, you can make something safer or less toxic. But if it's not better, people won't adopt it. You know, And, and that, that's something that I, I saw my professors a uh, generation ago, non-toxic things came out. They bought into a whole ecosystem of it only to find out it didn't work. And it, so people swore off that, you know, and I think for us, it was really important to take this process and really push it as far as we could to see if we could get it to to comparable levels. And I, um, I didn't talk about grad school, but I, I my grad school studies were in Italy for a few years and at Temple Rome. And I had a very traditional etching and printmaking education. I was a very, I still am a very traditional printmaker. Um, so for me, the, it, it was never about coming up with a process that the end product looked like an etching. It had to maintain the same process elements of printmaking that, that attract me to the medium. So I work for hours on a plate because of the process. It's never about an end result and saying that looks like an etching. And sometimes a process can come around, a, say a photographic process, where you can produce something that looks just like an etching, but it was done with drawing on a transparency and you know exposing it onto a plate. It removes the physical process of the medium that actually yields the content and what makes it interesting and what really attracts me to the medium. We wanted to develop it in a way that it maintained all the aspects of the traditional process. What's funny about, this will be a humble brag, I tell my students this whenever I say it, but after you came out and did the curator, uh, we, I met with all the curators, I was invited to the Metropolitan Museum of Art the following year to give a talk uh, on the process and I got to give this awesome panel with Nadine Orenstein, who's the curator there, and Felix Harlan from Harlan and Weaver. If you don't know them on Instagram, you should look up Amazing Prince. And uh, James Sienna, who is an amazing artist. And, you know, what was interesting about that is I think I showed up, and in some ways I was showing this new technology that we're dealing with. But in other ways, I was we were doing stuff more traditional than what Felix Harlan was doing at Harlan and Weaver. You know, we were still 
putting a ball ground, you know, we're developing our own grounds where you still put them on traditionally and smoke the plates. So it's not about finding something new. It's about going back to what, you know, what is really traditional too, and bringing that in. You know, it's interesting, like when I was in school and if there was a conversation between traditional and non-traditional, people would say, oh, traditional hard ground, but you know, is a petroleum-based liquid hard ground a traditional ground? It wasn't around, you know, at the at the, the beginning of, of printmaking. So where does tradition start and stop? You know, so so it's interesting. Those kind of things I think are things I think about all the time as we're developing this stuff. Um, I always think of the non non toxic as as well, obviously safety related, but also trying to um, simplify the steps or you know make it easier somehow and. In some ways. So when we started working through this process, we found that we couldn't get the quality of line. It took me over a year to develop grounds. And I went through hundreds of grounds. And to do that, went back to really actually that the exhibition that I gave a talk at the Met was called uh, The Renaissance of Etching. And Nadine put together this amazing catalog, which actually traces the history of etching. And to see what people use at the very beginning, ultimately, it was going back and finding different waxes and resins. And in the end, we made we made a, an etching ground that is food safe. And it etches as beautiful. So for, as a traditional etcher, Charbonneau ball hard ground was what I used on all my plates. Um, this etches as good or better than it. And it's, it's food safe. So there's no reason not to be using it. It's just we keep doing what we know and we don't kind of look back. The ground was the, you're saying the ground was the key to the whole thing. The ground was one of the major things was to get something that actually held up in the bath over long voltages. But it's only one thing of a lot of things. Like we developed our own biosolvent to, to take off waxes, to take off paints and grounds. And it's 100% non-toxic. We made it in the chemistry lab with different biodiesels and stuff. It's a whole thing. You know, it's it's grounds. It's no more solvents. It's uh, different aquatint materials, all kinds of things go into it to figure it out. When I teach, I show students my first prints. And when I look back at those prints, they were made by someone who didn't know what was going to happen ever. I was doing something and it brought something into the prints that, you know, after you teach for 15 years, you get to where you know, not not to toot my own horn, I think anyone would say this, you start to kind of know results and you start to get comfortable. And part of the cool thing about this process is it just threw me. I mean, it knocked me on my ass in a way that things weren't working and I had to work through and every day was an experiment to see what's going to happen. And that, that I've been doing that now for, you know, I don't know, a decade. And I feel like now I've amassed so much knowledge and different things that happen in different ways. And it's an interesting thing, I think, to keep me connected into the medium, I guess, and see it in a different way. So I have two questions. One, when you're taking copper particles off of what you are trying to get an image into, and they are depositing on the opposite piece of metal, same metal, mm -hmm. not same metal, mm -hmm. different metal. Uh, copper, copper and steel. Okay. We're doing, we're working with copper and steel. Okay. Do they deposit in a random fashion, or do they? Is there any correlation between where they've come from and where they land? No, it depends on the distance of the grid. Those are things we had to work through. How much distance is between them is how they settle in ways, but also how much resistance, you know, with your. Um, well, with your voltage and current and amps, but also the amount of exposed copper versus the amount of copper that you're putting it on. There's a relationship there, right? Like if you have one line in the center of a plate and you put a massive piece of copper on the other side, a lot more copper, that line is really going to be all that copper, that, that, that grid is going to be calling for all that copper. So the etch, it can affect the, the etch length and time. Wow. Um, but another really cool thing that affects etch length and time is the voltage. So What's what's nice is, you know, you can have a, a weak bath or a strong bath just by turning a dial, which is pretty cool. So the same etcher can use something you don't want to take off more or less or based on your voltage. And also there's no active etching going on. So I have a bath in my studio and if I'm if I'm teaching and uh, that bath turns off on a timer, it's not etching anymore. I come back a half hour later, it's just sitting in the bath. There's so much interesting stuff. And, you know, I, I would say my fault has been trying very hard to get it out, but it's very hard when you're so busy between teaching and doing this stuff and getting it out. So I hope to get a lot of it out 
you know, at the conference and share things with people too. And, and, you know, I was doing a lot of visiting artist things, but you only reach so many people with that. And after a few years of shutdown with COVID, that hasn't happened as much, but. Um, well, hopefully the podcast will help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully. And, and I really encourage everybody to reach out to me if you have questions. I'm happy to help. And yeah, we'll put all your, your stuff in, in the show notes. Everyone will be, you'll be flooded, I'm sure. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> but the, so I think I've got this all wrong. So the metal that is receiving the particles is a mesh weaved thing. It's not a solid piece of metal. Oh, we use a mesh weave. We use a mesh weave for, for what we're doing. Yep. Per, and because? Just to try to equal the general amount of copper on the, okay. uh, on the plates. So it's bigger in size, but has uh, just as much copper because it's woven threads yeah. of... Yep. Okay. Yep. And we, you know, being part of arts and sciences, I get great students and a lot of my undergrads get undergraduate research scholarships from the college. The college has been very supportive of this research. And those students work with me every semester. I have two starting in the fall. And as part of their research, they build small baths. So we build very small baths that they use for research and then they have their own bath after they graduate. You know, one of the things we all learned from COVID was when you don't have access to a shop, things change. And sometimes when you're in school, that's great. And it's great for people like me that have built a career around being in a studio all the time. Um, but most people you graduate, and especially in those first couple of years, if you're not in a city, and the fact that my students graduate with small tanks and they can keep etching. I mean, I have one student that's just phenomenal, and she's been etching every day and posting them on Instagram and just, you know, amazing work, just being able to do it, you know, on her front porch. So I mean, we have baths that small. And then in our research lab, I'm etching two foot by three foot plates now um, in 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 uh, one of the prints. I don't know if you oh, can see. That's, that. a, that's a print. That's a two foot by three foot plate wow. right there. So you can wow. see we've custom fabricated huge baths for electro etching too. So we have all kinds of sizes. So those all take, of course, different grids and concentrations and things. Like right. That. What's the what's the solution, the conductive solution? Uh, copper sulfate, primarily copper, copper sulfate. Yep, oh, okay. sulfate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Copper sulfate and distilled water. And if you okay. look at the article in Leonardo, that has our exact measurements, but but we'll have more stuff hopefully out too. By, by conference <laughs> time, I'll have easier stuff for you to digest too on it all. Sounds like you need to write a book, Jason. <laughs> in your spare time, you've indicated that this process gives you a finer line, but how? The electrolytic etch produces a perfectly perpendicular line to your plate surface. So when you're etching in a ferric chloride bath, it's a corrosive process. It's corroding the line away. If you look at a plate from uh, um, horizontally with a microscope, you would see it's almost like a V shape. And if you look at it through these atomic force microscopes that I got to see, it looks like big craters on the moon. I mean, it's just this crazy kind of uh, rough kind of slivers coming down in ways. The electrolytic etch is a perfectly perpendicular line. It's a perfectly straight down line. Now, I have plates that I've made with it, just really detailed line etchings. And, you know, what I found with Farrick, if you put a, let's see, in comparison to etchings, if you put like a two-minute, three-minute et line etch on a plate that's in Farrick, it really just comes out as an under-etched line. It inks up and it just doesn't feel right. It's a thin line, but it feels like you didn't etch your plate long enough. With the electrolytic etching, because it's so perpendicular, that very fine line looks crisp and intentional. It has a certain intention. You know, when people see some of the plates that I make with the range of line from the lightest line to the dark, they some a lot of people think it's two plates. They think it's like a Payne's gray and a black. You know, it, sometimes it looks as if I've taken the side of a scraper and actually scraped a big gash in the plate. But you can draw a line with the ground that we use, the finest line with a sewing needle and put it in for a long time. And it will... It will open up to, you know, an eighth of an inch, but it's still crisp and clean. It still has that crisp and clean. I and mean, it's not to say it's better or worse. It's different. It's a little bit different. But if you're after that sort of precision, it's really pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing to see, you know, to experience, I think, when you see an etching like that. Right. Can you easily tell the difference between an electrolytically etched line and an engraved line? Uh, you know, you can in, in, yeah, yes. I mean, yes, you can tell. Even with those microscopes, you can see, and you can see the fineness of those lines. It's it's very clean. When I first started demonstrating this, I remember a really awesome printmaker I really respect, Ed Bernstein, who used to teach at University of Indiana Bloomington, said, you know, yeah, but it's so clean. You know, it's too clean. Just oh. curious. So that was interesting. And, you know, if you see the expanse of my body of work, some stuff is very intricate, but some stuff is really gritty and rough. So that was something that I kind of 
sat with me for a while and I've worked really hard on ways to actually give it that gritty feel. So I can show you plates now that have just really gritty and crazy lines. So you can accomplish it all. It's just, it's like a little way. It's like reinventing the wheel. We just got a new press and there's a guy that restores them. And he came and I was asking him all these questions. He said, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. Like I was learning, because I don't know a lot about it. And with this, I really embrace reinventing the wheel. I think there's something about it. And when, you know, when you think about the history of prints, yeah, we look at artists and we, you know, I, I was thinking about this after doing that Met talk, but you look at where different breaks happen and where big progress happened. And you look at someone like Kahlo and you say, man, he changed things, but he also invented his own ground, you know, and you start to look back and you see that relationship that these artists, Hercules Sagers, William Blake. So these artists that we all respect, but it's hard to say, I really respect, I look up to that artist, but then be anti trying something new, you know, cause that's what these artists were all about. And that's what, that's what did it. So, you know, and you can say, I'm into traditional artists like Kahlo and William Blake, but they weren't traditional at their time. So all these things are stuff I've kind of worked through in my head as I've started trying to figure out, you know, what does that mean? Where do I stand in this whole pantheon of printmaking? My second question has to do with what happens when it's not line. Can you do the spit bites and the aqua tents and the, the you know, noise throwing the plate across the t floor, that kind of thing? One of the biggest issues with electrolytic etching has been not being able to get really rich aquatants and man we you know we worked on it forever and we just we've done everything and it was just in about the last month that we found a formula where we're getting just the most inky blacks that 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 you'll see so it's really exciting none of that's been published yet hopefully we can get that out you know we're working through it now test plates and stuff but but that was always a big thing. So we're getting really, really rich blacks now. So yes, you can get things. There's learning curve to it all, but there was a learning curve to learning traditional etching too. I don't think it's any more complicated or difficult than that. It's just there's different things you have to kind of, you know, do in ways. I also don't want to speak as if I kind of have it all figured out and want to share it with the world. Part of it is you work through it and you want people, and that's what going visiting artists and doing demos so that other people take it on because that's how things in our field get solved. There's no money to be made off solving something like this, but there's no, <laughs> there's no reason, and there's no reason to, to kind of have it locked in your own little space. Like, I figured this out. It only happens because you're so busy and it's hard to get it out there, but I'm hoping this conference, not only for what we're doing, but I think there's so many people like me. I know there's so many people like me doing stuff all over the place, making their own litho crayons, doing all kinds of things that just hopefully this gives a, a venue for everyone to get together and share, which then kind of builds off and, and continues to continues to grow that way. Right. Okay. So let's talk about your own work. <laughs> Actually, before we get to that, I just want to say when I was looking at the Kansas Caprichos mm -hmm. that were up when we visited with the print council, mm -hmm. I remember having a conversation with the group as we were standing in the studio and you were there and Katrina was there about as a cataloger of works on paper in a museum, if one of those came across my desk, would I describe it in the media line differently than I would a regular etching? Mm -hmm. If people haven't seen this process in action, how in the world will they be able to tell? I can tell that it's not traditional etching because it is so much finer, Okay, but I think I would be confused between traditional etching and okay. engraving somewhere. So you're talking yeah, about like, the, the process thing. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it makes any difference. You know, it doesn't make a difference to me. I would call it etching. When I do show the work, I write electrolytic etching. What I found is if you talk to another printmaker and say, hey, electrolytic etching is cool, isn't it? People say, oh, okay, good. But they don't, nobody really, you know, you've kind of heard about, oh, it's, a, it's sort of a parlor trick thing. Yeah, but I will never do it. And so... What I think the best way to get it out there is people seeing work made by other artists using it. And so in an educational way, in that way, is really the only reason that I refer to them, you know, when I send things out, because I'm hopeful that when someone sees it, they say, oh, that was made with that process. And it helps kind of maybe open minds to maybe try, trying it out. But, but, you know, I think in printmaking, every time my grad students have their thesis exhibition, they, they wonder, should I put, you know, mono, monotype with screen print with this on this, or should I just put print, you know, or etching or, you know, it's complicated. But I think as printmakers, it's important for us to step back because we can get, we can fall too much in love with the process and just talk process. Sure, and sure. Ultimately, the work is about the imagery. So sometimes it's, you know, it's, 
healthy for us to not delve too far into it. But but I, as a curator or as I, I have no idea <laughs> what, what I would do. Um, we like to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so with your own work, I, I spied a really fantastic thing you said, and which was printed, I think, in Liz Seaton's brochure on your show a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. If I find myself laughing while I'm working, that usually means the print is on its way, which I thought was hilarious because your stuff is kind of dark. You know, I'm from Florida, and <laughs> I didn't know how weird Florida was when I when you grow up somewhere. In fact, as a student, you never you have these visiting artists come from all over the country and everyone sounds so interesting. When I first met Keith Francis from Mississippi and he had this thick Mississippi accent was making work about, Oh, that's so cool. And I'm just nobody from this boring place. And then when I left Florida, that's when I realized how crazy it was and the dark humor. And in fact, I always considered the humor in my work. And then when I got to Philadelphia and, and showed it, um, the response was way different. It was really psychological. People were almost concerned about me a little bit. And my mind was humorous. I never looked at it that way. It was imaginative and playful in my mind. But um, uh, I think some of it comes from that. I think some of the authors that I read in Florida, you know, dark, you know, you know, all the, I think there's just, there's a certain dark humor that I, that I like in it. But, but just because I'm laughing doesn't mean I expect the viewer to, I think that's, no, know, I know, I know. And, but no, but this is a, you know, an interesting point maybe for when you see one of my prints, it's probably gone through, you know, at least seven or eight states, usually way more than that. And it's states where I scrape out, you know, huge elements and rebring them in and take it out. And, it. and a lot of that, that laughter and playfulness is in my process, but it's not necessarily in the, the final content of the work, but it's very much an enjoyable process when I'm making, I'm not sitting there kind of delving into, you know, dark, I, you know, it's so, so in that way, I think that's where it is. It's it, when that's activated in me, when I'm having a good time working through something, when I'm entertained by it, I think that's when I know something's happening. If that mm. makes sense. No, that does make sense. No, absolutely. I just, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, I was not trying to say that your work is lighthearted. Oh, it doesn't read lighthearted to me, but that just goes to the point that you can't control what people see in your work. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and that 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 line about that comes from a, a a really great book on the history of printmaking. If you're not from, familiar with it, called "The Bite of the Print" by Frank and Dorothy Geitlin, and they trace the whole history of printmaking and they combine it with dark humor and print from the start to the end. It's a really easy reading book and it goes from everything from talking about, you know, we associate fingerprints with getting arrested. You know, there's just this whole kind of dark side of printmaking that's kind of interesting. That way of thinking is definitely inspired by that book. Well, you and you quoted them somewhere. I also noted that one. You quoted them as saying, many a first rate printmaker has deceived himself and others into thinking that what he really wants to do is reform our vices. He doesn't at all. He wants to point them out, laugh at them, weep at them, shrug his shoulders at them, but above all, to insist that they are, in fact, there, which I thought was, was to- perfectly describes you and your ethos. I, yeah, I really believe that. And I really connected with that. I think that's really part of my work. And, you know, I think there's so much black and white out there right now of good and evil, black and white, left and right. There's all these cross cultures across, you know, everything. And I think I've always wanted to make people think I wanted to raise thoughts and, you know, have people contemplate that gray area that really we all exist in. You seem to be one who looks back at history, which I assume is your experiences living in Italy. And to talk about what drew you there and, and what effect it had on your work. I, uh, I graduated from UCF. Like I said, I took a printmaking class towards the end, but I really got obsessed. I made, you know, 50 or 60 prints in one class. I was obsessed, very, very obsessed. Um, I made a body of work and I got accepted into Tyler School of Art, which is a really amazing school in Philadelphia. They also have a campus in Rome, Italy. And as part of my acceptance, they gave me a a full ride to go to Rome for one year. I got a beautiful studio and I pretty much looked at art and made work every day. I mean, it was the most amazing experience, you know, of my life. I've been back, of course, many times, but, but that time still was just so transformative to me. I was very much a student of history. I was one credit short of an art history, I think minor, but I loved art history and it was amazing. So that's what drew me there. My background is, is Italian. My dad and his brothers are full Italian. My grandparents um, came over here. I think there's a connection there for me culturally and a connection with my family, but also just Italy in general. It's funny when you're in undergrad 
your art history teachers are always trying to get you to form an opinion on things, you know, form an opinion on what you like and don't like, which is important. So I would say things like, I love Michelangelo and the hard lines, but really I'm not into Venetian or I'm not into Titian. And, <laughs> and then you get to Italy and you see it and you just, your mind starts rewinding. Like, who did I say these dumb things about? I'm not into this and that. And you know, probably the, one of the biggest things that happened to me in Italy was seeing art across such an expansive period of time in such different mediums and approaches, but all still being just amazing. You know, seeing a, a Byzantine mosaic that, well, you know, was half destroyed or an ancient relic and then seeing Michelangelo and then seeing, you know, Pontormo, all these things that I tried to in my brain form likes and dislikes. I like this. And then realizing the top of all of everything is just amazing. And what is that? Like what what is there in that work? When you're in school and you're taking drawing class, there's a clear thing. You say, this is drawn well, it's good. This is not drawn well, you know. But then when you see a classical Greek sculpture and you say, that's amazing, and you feel physically moved by it, and then you see a, a you know, a mosaic, you know, in Ravenna that's totally different. It has none of that drawing. It's naive in the sense of drawing, you know, in, in a certain way of thinking about it. And it still has that power. So then it really flips your brain around and you start to look at your own work and say, what is good? What is not good? And in printmaking, it might be, well, are people looking at my prints and saying, I love these, the aquatints are great. Is that a good thing? So then where do you eliminate? So a lot of the work where it's very just a needle on the plate was me eliminating, just trying to eliminate anything that somebody could like besides the content, just forcing them. If they're going to connect, it's just going to be that. There's not going to be, oh, I like the texture there. or the you know. And that, I think, a lot was from Italy and seeing all those different things and trying to figure out what is inside that work that, that hits me in that way. And I, if I can't distill it down to a, a certain style or a certain technique, then what is it? And you know, that's something I continue to just you know, work through in my head and in my work all, all the time. I just want to name drop some people from Tyler, if that's okay, too, that I worked oh, with sure. that were amazing. So when I was at Temple Rome, I worked with a phenomenal Italian printmaker named Mario Teleri, who is now in Venice and is just a phenomenal guy, and he, he taught me so much. My other major professor in Italy was an artist who's now really famous, Stanley Whitney. He was really well-known then, but now he's had a real career resurgence, and he was a really... Uh, big supporter of my work um, in Italy and um, a friend. And then when I got back from Rome, I worked with Dan Dahlman, Richard Rico, and John Dow, who were, th were three professors at Tyler that were just also, also amazing. Hey, it's Anne again. I'm popping in to report that Jason wanted to mention one other professor that was important to his work in Rome when he was there. That would be Shara Wasserman, who is the contemporary art curator there. I mean, Tyler School of Art can't say enough good things about it. That's great. All right. So what's the most recent print you've been working on? I'm working on this series of prints now that I really haven't shown. I haven't shown, I've shown maybe in one show, but I really, you know, it's funny. I was, and I was on such this kind of, I kind of describe it as being on a, on a train, just moving so fast. And I was doing so much and I was going from one thing to the next. And I, you know, I, in some ways I feel like I was just caught up in it and, I just was saying yes to everything and doing everything. And, you know, and when the pandemic hit, in some ways it was really good for me because it just knocked me off that train. And I think secretly I wanted to get off it for a while, but it's really hard to say no when you're trying to do all these things and opportunities are coming. And it really uh, stopped me from showing. I started a series of drawings and I worked every day, you know, pretty much every day in my studio on a, kind of a series of crazy drawings. I have hundreds of them now. And I'm building plates loosely based off of the drawings, but it's this series and I'm making these sort of colossal head sculptures now. Um, and I'm referring to them in my own mind as this sort of proxy war monuments, you know, thinking about Goya and the disasters of war, which were just amazing. What I'm telling you now is not content. It's sort of inspiration. It's the stuff going through my head as I'm making them, you know, where they end up, I'm not sure. But I've thought about kind of what a proxy war meant of course, we're sort of in one, you know, now with, with Ukraine. But I wasn't thinking military-wise. In my mind, I'm thinking about the internal struggles that I'm going through and that we're all going through. Like I said earlier, whether it's like the news media, there's a war between, you know, getting your... It's all, it's all taking place in our heads right now. We're, we're, we're exposed to so much information that we're going through so much. And for me, it's a little bit... Uh, uh, 
I'm trying to, I'm making these sort of colossal monuments to that sort of war, so sort of the inner psyche sort of war going on with all that stuff. That's just what's kind of driving the work right now. In the same way that when I started making the colossal, those colossal foot ones, I was just making those feet every day and different things were coming through my head. It wasn't until later that I started to formulate what was going on more in them. And at this stage, I'm just in the state I'm just making. Every day I get up, I'm working on those plates. There's some that I consider finished, but they're really not ready to show yet. And I really want to have enough of them and have it a little more dialed in before I start to exhibit. And maybe I have sabbatical now, and I'm hoping that's a time to really work through them and, and yeah, I don't know if that answers. That's a free <laughs> to see some pictures. I could share some photos, but well, there's some. Yeah, yeah, there's some on your website. Yeah, I put. I have a few on my website that are in progress that you can see sort of um, um, levels of them. Right. When you go on, I've never worked anywhere that I was able to go on sabbatical. Uh-huh. Do they expect you to complete a certain thing and you have to report back, or do they just let you go? No, when you do a sabbatical, you apply for it, and it's not always given. It's a competitive thing, and you apply. Um, with a plan, you know, with a sort of a mission of what you're going to do. I guess you could see my research sort of in one hand, it's this body of work. The other hand is developing the technical research that we're doing and getting that out. So that's another thing. The conference is, of course, another thing that I think some of my printmaker friends think I am mad for taking that on during sabbatical, that I should be in Italy right now. But, you know, I have two kids in school and I, you know, and we'll do a little traveling, but I I, I'm excited about the, you know, the conference. So that would be an aspect of it too. Yeah. The conference is a big nut. I, I interviewed someone who said, you know, I, the teaching actually is a way for me to continue in community with people and no, in collaboration. Yeah. And that was really super helpful for their work also. I agree. I think, you know, I think as an artist, you're going to have to compromise somewhere. If you're a gallery artist, you're going to make compromises in some ways. If you're a professor, you're going to make compromises. If you're a K through 12 educator, you know, you're always going to make compromises. You're absolutely right. It is a whole nother job. When you're at a research university, 50% is your teaching, 50 is your research, and you have to, you know, try to balance those. And it's, well, 10% is service, which ends up of course, being more like 50% of service, but you're balancing that stuff. This was the right compromise for me. It's amazing to be in a studio. If you teach in a good program with good students, it's amazing to be in a studio with 20 other young, hungry artists excited about printmaking, excited about making art. There's nothing that that could equal it. It's just, it's the most amazing thing. So yeah, it's very inspiring. It's emotionally draining. You know, it's it's a, not just physically draining, it's emotionally draining because we're artists. We're all sensitive people. We're all drawn to this for some reason. We're all complicated. We're sensitive. Uh, the things sometimes that make us really good artists make us hard at being normal people, you know, so you're dealing with your own issues, you're dealing with your students' issues, and you're trying to mentor them, you're trying to mentor yourself. It's absolutely a lot of of time. So a sabbatical is nice to get some time to, to focus back on your work, which is, you know, important. I work on my work prolifically while I'm teaching, but it's always divided time, you know, between teaching, and then you can get 20 minutes in here, then you got to answer an email. It is nice when you do get a sustained amount of time to work through through some work for sure. Have you tried to get the art history department to start up a history of prints class? Yeah, I don't think our our program right now I don't think is large enough to to sustain it. I you know, I don't know. It's it's we have an amazing art historian, two amazing art historians. One is Dr. Glenn Brown who is the biggest ceramic critic in the country, and then we have Dr. Douglas Dow who's a Renaissance art historian and just phenomenal art historian. But I I'm friends with him and I have over wine convinced him gradually to keep including more and more printmaking into the into the art history survey classes so they definitely get some printmaking but nothing like what a history of printmaking class uh, offers right for sure. right i mean the part of the problem is that is that the the canon comes down and whatever you learned in school you believe is the canon and and making room for other is really tough and printmaking has always been other Sadly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's always, but, but I think, I think printmakers are attracted to that. It's an underdog medium and we're attracted in that way to it. And it's, it's also been a medium that was inclusive well before a lot of these other mediums were inclusive. So it's really cool that, um, that it has that history too. I think people find their way into print shops for a lot of reasons. I think that's definitely one of them. I think the feeling right. of belonging. Yeah. And, and I, 
firmly believe that the history prints is the history of our shared mm -hmm. visual culture, right? So mm -hmm. Images would never have started to exist in any way that was accessible to normal people, if not for prints. And I feel like the art historians that are focused on the sort of painting, sculpture, architecture canon are missing a huge piece of the story, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because all of those painters really learned from prints. You know, they all, all the stuff, exactly. everyone learned from prints, so it was just, it was embedded. We can't even fathom it, you know? It would be like, you know, social media today. It was so embedded into the, the culture of everything. It's, right. You know. All right, yeah, I'll continue to cheerlead for prints. <laughs> And, you know, one thing I'll, I'll mention, we have a graduate program here, and that's been probably one of the coolest things for me is uh, working with graduate students. And I have had the best experience with grads. I've had, the, I've had amazing students come out and study with me. I'm always grateful and surprised that they will choose to come out here. We are a small program. I'll have between one to three students. I have, I have one that's just graduating now and two that are current. And you know, they are just some of the, the, the best students and they're all, they're all out there working and I kind of want to drop their names too, if I can, because they're doing awesome sure. stuff. But uh, Nathan Edwards is teaching in Iowa. Uh, JoLynn Regaluth has galleries and lives in Indianapolis. Marco Hernandez teaches at Wichita State University. Brandon Williams teaches in Nashville, Tennessee at Belmont. Uh, Benjamin Engel teaches in, uh, in Gainesville and, uh, Becky Spruill teaches in, in, in Texas now, and she's the vice president of MA, MAPC, so I'm getting to work with her in that role. Haley Quick, uh, I think, is going to have an announcement for teaching pretty soon, but just a phenomenal um, etcher and lithographer. Hey, it's Anne again with one last edition. Jason wanted to note one other graduate student of his, Michael Burke, who is teaching out in Portland. My last graduate student to graduate is Brian Raimundo, and he'll be uh my sabbatical replacement this year. And he was awarded the top GTA award for the entire university last year. So doing amazing things. And then my, my, my current student, Kira Litwin, is, is amazing and also away at the Taylor Swift concert. So I'm waiting for her to get back to help us <laughs> clean up the shops. And I have a new grad starting, Aaron Stefan, who's coming from University of Central Florida. And he was also a master printer at Flying Horse. So, you know, most of the grad students that come out and study with me come because their professors know me or see something in their work and think they're a good fit. We get to know each other so well. I stay in touch with them all, and they're just amazing people, and they're really all doing really amazing work. So I rattled off their names, but look up any of them, and you'll see some uh, some amazing printmakers. And, you know, one thing about being out in the Midwest and also about this technology that we're developing, I think it's so important to try to get access to as many people as possible to these mediums and being able to do this. And the idea that this electrolytic etching process can be something students can take or people can be doing it outside of art epicenters. In my mind, I think the next Goya doesn't come from New York or LA. I think the next Goya is going to be some person sitting out somewhere doing really important work, they're not going to be someone who has access to tons of things, but they're going to be someone that has a little bit of time and a lot to say. I think it's so important to get that information out. This technical information that we're developing and other information and, you know, ho hopefully for this conference, we're going to attract K through 12 educators. We're going to try to get people from all over to come in. And I, and I hope it's an opportunity for everyone in the field to share, you know, their knowledge and help build the medium out that way. COVID, I think for me, was an eye-opener about, I got to start showing students things like stenciling. We have to really take things, processes down and get people as much as they can because when they get out there, they need to be able to make stuff and express themselves. Yeah, some of the greatest art, you know, Kathy Collowitz carving on old doors with, with dull tools. Goya making the disasters during an actual war, you know, happen during these times when resources are scarce and, and happen from people that are just so have such a passion to say something, the more we can get materials and mediums and, and information out to people, the more potential there is for great art to be made. A lot of those grad students and so many of my BFAs are out there making what I consider really great work that is going to really stand the test of time. Is the MFA program geared towards teaching or is it a straight up MFA and they happen to all have gotten really great jobs? <laughs> Ours is geared towards teaching in the sense that the people that we bring in get full rides in exchange for teaching. I don't bring someone in unless I feel like we can get them funding. And so the students that come here typically get full tuition and stipend 
and in exchange they teach so they teach classes with us so they learn to teach so that's why i say they're also co-workers of mine because they're teaching with me and then eventually when they get towards the end actually teaching their own intro level classes the students that came here and wanted to teach are now teaching the ones that didn't are not and that's one thing i think in working with students i'm a big goals person so we sit down the first day of grad school and we make a detailed you know, semester, year, three year, five year, and we change and we go over them every semester, but that helps us craft an individual approach to where they want to get to. One of my uncles gave me one of those Anthony Robbins personal motivator books at one point. And uh, I remember I never, I didn't really read it, but in the beginning he talks about, he set a goal for living in California on the beach with a Lamborghini and, and look at him, he achieved it. So this is how important goals are. And I said, you know, that sounds so stupid. And then I had this moment where I realized when I sat in my undergraduate, I did have a very clear goal. I wanted to teach at a university. I wanted to run a print shop. I really wanted it to be a campus where there was a coffee shop where I could just walk over and get a coffee. I had this vision of my life and I said, oh my God, like this is what I have. I do think, why didn't I just say on the beach in California with a Lamborghini <laughs> and it would have been amazing, but I didn't in hindsight, you know, 2020, but, but really what was important to me has come to pass. As an artist, there's no clear path. It's not like accounting where there's a step ladder of going. It feels like it in school, but the minute you get out that path disappears. So, so how do you know which decision to make? It's very hard. So if you have some goals, that makes it a little bit easier to say, yeah, I'll do this, or no, I won't do that because it's not aligning with my goals. And so I think, I think that's important. And I think as an artist, ultimately, you have to make a decision. There's no right or wrong. But then, you know, I encourage my students to just commit and make that decision be the right decision through hard work. Beside the the grad students who help teach in the department, are there other print professors there? Or uh, how, how big is the art department? I'm a one one person show. I'm the only printmaking professor, but there's multiple grads teaching with me. We have a really great department here. The cool thing about printmaking is almost every one of our professors has or does make prints in some way. Our graphic design professor, Murphy Picaste, who's actually co- Organizing this conference with me, she teaches traditional graphic design, but her personal work is letterpress. And most of the other professors in some way work in print or are familiar with print in some way. So our program is pretty interdisciplinary where the students work through different mediums and get different experiences that way too. But yeah, we are a relatively small program. And that can be a good thing, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having gone to a tiny school with two and a half <laughs> professors in the art history department. <laughs> All right. Well, what is the piece of advice you like to give young people as they embark on their careers, so besides sign and date your work? I would say when I sit down with my students and we talk about their work, I don't feel like it's my job to help them make good work. I don't feel like that's the leading part of my job, because if, if that's the goal, then a pretty easy solution to that goal would be to Look at some of these great printmakers making work right now. I could help someone make work like Tom Huck or make work like, you know, Catherine Polk or any, any of these printmakers. But I think the goal is to find what they really love, what really process-wise, imagery-wise, all that, what they really love to do. And I think once we locate that, and again, that can change too, then my job as a professor is to help them get good enough at doing it to get away with doing it. And I think if you approach your work that way, you, you run a risk because sometimes it might be a better solution to just look at what's, what's trendy or what someone who just got a teaching job's work looks like and makes that, that might actually increase your chances of, of getting a teaching job. But if you follow what you love to do, um, what you're drawn to do and push yourself hard enough to make it to, to make it undeniable to people, to make people have to look at it and take it serious. You do find some success that way. The benefit is then you get to do what you love pretty much for the rest of your life. I always think of Chuck Close's work. It's pretty interesting, but I would hate my life if I had to make his work every day, you know, but it's, it's good work. So sometimes a student comes in and they have an idea, oh, I'm going to do an etching like this and or I'm going to make this and that. And they're, they're in love with the idea, but the actual idea of making that thing destroys them. They want to see it. They have no interest in making it. You know, I've had students that I've thought have made really great work and never go on. And I think the reason was, is they really, they were trying to make it to impress or because they, they wanted to achieve a certain, certain vision, but it was at the expense of not really loving doing it. You know, they, they labored through it in a way that 
they're never going to go on and do that. It's hard to sustain that. So I think, I don't know, that's a long-winded kind of answer, but I hope it doesn't come off preachy or that I'm, I'm successful and let me show you my success. I'm not claiming it all to be successful. I never had goals of being famous or living in a big city. Pretty much what I'm doing was where my goals were. So I'm only sharing my story and where I kind of am and some of the things that helped me. And that's what I try to share with, you know, with my students. I've always loved to be making my work. I have a really active imagination. I love to, you know, put that needle on the, on the copper and draw. Um, I've always loved it. I've never really made work that I wasn't into or that I just wanted to see the final result. I just can't, I can't do it that way. And I know a lot of other artists can and make amazing work. I can't have an idea see a vision of something that's going to take 200 hours and then just execute it piece by piece. The whole piece has to be active throughout. So I share that with students because I think a lot of students are in that same boat. And I think that when you hear people like me talking now, it's hard to understand that, that they didn't have it all figured out. You know, I didn't have it figured out when I was an undergrad. I definitely didn't have it figured out in grad school. I still don't have it figured out at all. I mean, I don't, I, I have no confidence that I have anything figured out. I just know that I feel like what I'm doing now is important to be making for me. And I feel like it's, it does have something to say and that I have, I have faith that it's going to get there, but I have nothing figured out. Right. One, an artist that I interviewed not too long ago, Emma Nishimura, who's up in OCAD U in uh, Toronto, talked about the pressure of the sketchbook, of the student's sketchbook. <laughs> and when she was in school, she kept admiring all these you know, beautiful sketchbooks that had drawings, 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 and hers were full of writing. It was just ideas and processing stories and thoughts. And and her point to her students always is, you know, your sketchbook, it doesn't have to be Van Gogh's sketchbook or Leonardo's mm -hmm. sketchbook. Like it's it's your thing. Don't worry about them and mm -hmm. just keep going. Uh, that's interesting that you said I'm for someone who draws all the time. I'm not a traditional sketchbook person. I feel pressure with it. I don't like it. So I draw on loose paper. I'm also left-handed. And I think the idea of my hand always covering things, and I think even that has something to do with it. But I always work on loose paper, um, you know, in portfolios of loose paper. I mean, I carry a small sketchbook and I draw on it. But when I do, it's over like holidays, like over winter break, I do a sketchbook over summer. But it's just for me at that time, I felt that same that same pressure. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, my, my sketchbook was empty, which is why I'm not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I was never a journal or a diary of... person for the same reason. Right, exactly. I hate journaling. Ah, oh, gosh. All right. Well, Jason, I will get this out as soon as I can so that people hear it in order to create fabulous panels and whatever else for the conference. And I look for, I hope I can get there. It would be really great to see you in person in Kansas. Thanks, Anne. Thank you for interviewing me. And I think really what you're doing uh, is is great. And what we talked about with the lack of maybe history of prints, I think what you're doing fills a void. That's just, you know, amazing. I heard you, you know, speaking about gold seas, all these arts that I learned about that I study and I think are so important to get in front of students. And uh, I think what you're doing, my students all listen to to your podcast. Cool. And I think what you're what you're doing is, you know, is an, is an amazing thing. And I think the more that we can spread, you know, printmaking and all the different sides of it, I think uh, ultimately uh, is what keeps the medium alive. I think so. Yeah. I, yeah. My goal is to do that history thing and also talk to as many people in different parts of the ecosystem because there's room for everybody here. <laughs> yeah. And it's so cool. The board of MAPC is relatively young and it's so cool to see all the stuff coming up. You know, there's just it's too much cool stuff in printmaking going on all over. You could probably interview someone every day, you know, every day of the week. It's just, an, it's an amazing time to be making prints. There's amazing people that are making up the field. And I think it's going to continue to grow and, and get better. An important distinction that whether it's me or all printmakers, you know, we're not, we're not making prints to keep an old medium alive, but it's important to know that there's still nothing that can equal what we're doing. Technology can make things quicker and more affordable, but you'll never see a text printed on a page better than on a traditional letterpress. You'll never see a line on an etching. You'll never see the ink, you know, the, the, the black of a litho. You'll never see that stuff. So it's not that we're obsessed with being old fashioned. Like I said, in the beginning, printmaking is so expansive. I mean, the greatest technology, the most advanced technology is using print in some capacity. And I think that if you're a young artist starting out and have to defend printmaking or talk about it, to realize that you're drawn to it because there's nothing like it. Whether it's the final result or the process itself, there's something there that needs to be kept alive and there's stuff that can only be said through our medium. 
Well said, Jason. <laughs> that was good. You're so eloquent. I swear to God. I saw a video you made years ago that Shelley Thorsonson shared with me that was making the case of the state. And I was like, oh, my God, in this three little minute nugget, you just wrapped it all up. I was like, God dang it. <laughs> well, you know, Anne, I did that because COVID hit. I'll tell you, you know, when the pandemic hit, one of my biggest fears was everything we've talked about today, the communal spirit, everything that draws students into printmaking is going to is gone. We were doing like remote and and it it felt like we were going to lose it. And I, I couldn't take the idea that students weren't going to be excited and inspired and see it and get that experience. And I, you know, I watched this video on how to do these live Zoom lectures. And it said, you know, it's kind of like how people do social media now, reels, like animate this and that. And I made one take on my phone and watched it and deleted it immediately and said, this is never seeing the light of day. I'm never doing this. But then I, I saw schools like Harvard or maybe it was Yale had these trailers for their classes. And, you know, I'm sure they were big budget. They brought in a big team, but I thought, that's going to be the way. How can I get students to to connect them in a little bit and get them excited? And so I taught myself, you know, like everybody did during COVID, I taught myself Adobe Premiere and got a microphone and got used to hearing your voice and hating it and just said, I don't care anymore. But when, you, when you're in your 40s, you do stop caring, like everyone says. If you look at the MAPC site, we have a trailer for it. And I had to use my voice with that. I always joke that it's a placeholder for Morgan Freeman. But now I think with AI, I actually might be able to get his voice on it. But, but you know, <laughs> I mean, how embarrassing is that to record some kind of trailer and put it on there with your voice? But who else is going to do it at some point? Life short. That's where a lot of that came from. I definitely don't feel good about it all or proud of my voice. Or, but I feel like it just things you kind of decide it's got to get done. I want it to get done. And, you know, and so, so you do it, but that, thank you. You know, thank you. I made those videos with the intention that only my students would see them because I was so embarrassed, but now I know people have, you know, I, I know I've shared them more now and I think I feel a little more comfortable with them. I'm not a very comfortable, the social media thing, you know, is, is still my, I'm amazed how comfortable my students are just posting the idea when a print off the press instantly, like just showing your print, showing your print, showing your print feels so different than the way I think. Like, I really want to work through so much of it and then have this sort of, I've worked through all the, I've worked through this now here. It's hard for me to think of putting a print up and then scraping out a little corner, then putting it up again. It's hard to retrain your brain to think, no, just like, here's a print, here's a proof, here's a proof. That's a different exposure to art, but it's something that a lot of new printmakers really have a comfort level of that. It's a whole different cultural thing that's happening that I feel like makes me feel my age, you know, feel a little bit older. <laughs> I think it's really exciting and interesting and I love seeing my students do it, but I'm still, when my students video me, I'm hesitant for them to put it online. You know, I, there's a feeling to, even, of course, this is really nerve wracking to me to, you know, to do a, do a podcast and live out there. It's, you know, it's, it's hard, I think, to, to get used to that, but this is the world we're living in. And it, with any new technology brings way more opportunities. It, it's cool to imagine how emerging and young printmakers are going to use these to open new doors and do things. I, I get to sit on a little bit of a perch, I guess, and watch and not feel as <laughs> right, intimidated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you think, you you think it was okay? Should we do another take? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I rambled like I do in, when I'm talking to my students. So I, I don't I don't know if you can make me sound less rambly or what, you know, but I don't know. <laughs> no, I want to let you talk. Hopefully yeah, no, something. it was great. You did great. <laughs> Jason, thank you so much for coming on Plate Mark today. It was such a joy talking to you about all the, th gosh, you're busy. Things, all of the things. It was great. Thanks, Anne. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Hey, everybody. It's Anne. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode with Jason Shula. I, I hope you gleaned some golden nuggets from his conversation, our conversation, I should say. I, I, I find him so engaging and lovely. Thank you to him, Jason, obviously, for being a wonderful guest. And also one to, as usual, Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. And also one to Dan Fury of Extension Audio for helping me with the sound. And a first pass at the editing. Super helpful. Thank you, Dan. All right. I think that's it. We'll see you next time.